Okay, now we're beginning part two of the EKG. So we're going to talk about ventricular dysrhythmias. So in ventricular dysrhythmias, there is a pacemaker other than the normal pacemaker of the heart, the SA node. The SA node has some backup, has some friends, but sometimes those friends don't do the job quite as well. So that's what happens when it's not the SA node, it's not the AV node. Now we have pacemakers in the ventricles. And when they fire, it is called ectopic foci. It means that there is a focus other than where it's supposed to be, causing this aberrant beat, causing this journey that's going all haywire all over the place. And I say that because the normal conduction pathway creates this beautiful systolic ejection, where it's in, when it's initiated somewhere else, you're creating a pathway that creates no systolic ejection. So this one aberrant beat is going to compromise cardiac output for that one beat. So it occurs prematurely. So the irritability is so severe that it, it actually overrides the normal conduction pathway, the normal SA node. And you see this wide and bizarre beat showing it's not the normal pathway and that it occurred prematurely. It occurred before the next beat was supposed to, uh, supposed to occur. Here we see one PVC. So when you palpate the pulse of this patient, you'll feel beep, 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 boop. And then something that occurs prematurely, you'll feel that very slight irregularity. And here we have it every other beat. So we're feeling the irregularity very regularly. So this particular rhythm is called ventricular bigeminy. It's not important that it's called bigeminy. What's important is that that foci is kicking in every other beat, compromising cardiac output every other beat. Here we have the top showing, you know, a pretty frequent regularity of those premature ventricular contractions, showing those wide and bizarre beats. The strip below shows, yes, that's occurring, but two of those ectopic foci beats two of those you know premature ventricular contractions don't look the same there's one that looks different it has a negative deflection instead of a positive deflection what that shows you is that there is not one foci in the ventricles that is irritable there is two so two irritable foci is worse than one you don't want two friends that are irritable down there helping you out you, you want maybe just one, and maybe we can take care of that friend somehow. But when there's two, it's, it's like you're outnumbering the normal conduction pathway. Here we have it's so irritable that it created two beats in a row. It created two um, aberrant beats compromising cardiac output for that short time. But what it represents is that you have increasing irritability, and that is called a couplet. Here is really a three beat run of what we now are going to change the name to ventricular tachycardia. So a three beat run of a PVC is called three beat run of VTAC. So it's so irritable, it's creating three of them. And if you try to figure out the rate, if this was sustained, you could see using that 300 method that it's probably 200 times per minute. So not only is it going to compromise cardiac output, the rate is so fast that you're going to compromise cardiac perfusion as well. And that's the best case scenario that you're even creating anything, any sort of systolic ejection or any sort of rational beat. So what we do about it is amiodarone. So amiodarone stabilizes the action potential. It slows down the refractory period. It stabilizes atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias. It is 150 milligrams over 10 minutes and then we want to put them on a drip to really stabilize the rhythm. So it is a milligram a minute for 18 hours. So we want to run amiodarone for 24 hours after that 150 milligram infusion. So it's a milligram a minute for six hours followed by half a milligram a minute for the subsequent 18 hours. Not necessarily um, vital information for you right now, but it's just so you know that amiodarone and other antidysrhythmics will require some sort of loading dose and then a maintenance infusion to try to really stabilize the patient's rhythm. So whether it be lidocaine or procanamide, you're going to have some sort of maintenance infusion following an incident. 
So here we are in ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is when that foci is really, it took over. So now we have a sustained incidence of a pulseless person, maybe, or sometimes ventricular tachycardia does create a pulse. So that's what we're going to talk about. We talked about how this is all aberrant beats in a row. The foci is irritable, just firing, took over that SA node, compromising cardiac output. But sometimes it could look so regular that maybe it's not what we think it is, or maybe, you know, we should treat it like the patient has a pulse. So that's the question that we ask when patients are in VTAC. Do they have a pulse? If they do have a pulse, then we treat them with amiodarone, 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. If they don't have a pulse, we treat them the same as patients that are in an even worse rhythm, a pulseless rhythm. We defibrillate with 200 joules on a biphasic defibrillator. All right, what happens when there's complete chaos in the ventricles? What happens when there is a quivering in the ventricles? So when we talked about atrial fibrillation, we talked about how because that foci was creating that chaos in the atria, there was actually quivering that occurs even having the chance for clots to form because it was so stagnant. Well, now we have that in the ventricles. So that's much worse. Now we have a complete co uh, compromised cardiac output quivering in the ventricles, and we have to get even more aggressive. So you could see, you know, it's either fine ventricular fibrillation. It looks all different kinds of squiggly lines. The fact of the matter is there is no systolic ejection. So we do CPR if it's unwitnessed. We want to try to get oxygen to the sites and everything else that the blood transports. And ultimately, we need to defibrillate this patient. 200 joules of a biphasic defibrillator, CPR in between. We repeat that defibrillation attempt up to two times, trying to obliterate that underlying ventricular fibrillation and hopefully having the SA node take over. If after two times fibrillation attempts don't do it successfully, now we need to up the ante. Now we need to get bigger guns and do drug shock. So now we're going to give epi first and then shock. So my point is to emphasize that defibrillation is the only thing that's going to convert it. These drugs are just going to improve the chances of that. So epi also in the meantime, because of its vasopressor effect, being a pure sympathomimetic drug, is going to shunt blood to the central circulation, the brain and the heart, while it's improving the chances for this countershock, this defibrillation attempt. So it lowers that threshold required to deliver this 200 joules biphasic shock. You can repeat epi every three to five minutes, so just keep that in mind. After the, after the epi is delivered, we do want to make sure that we um, bolus the patient, get the epi to the circulation so it, you know, it is the place where it's supposed to be, and then we shock. So because we can wait three to five minutes for the next epi, or we have to wait, I should say, we give the next drug in this algorithm, which I'm introducing you to, which is amiodarone. So amiodarone, 300 milligrams, IV push is the cardiac arrest dose followed with a bolus, and then we try defibrillation again with 200 joules biphasic defibrillator. So it's always drug shock after you've shocked that patient three times with the defibrillator in V-fib. Last but not least, cardiac standstill. This is when there is no electrical activity in the heart. So there are no squiggly lines. So you want the patient calm, but not that calm. And we do epinephrine, same dose, one milligram of a one to 10,000 or 10 milliliters, alternating that with CPR. We're trying to have the epi create some sort of electrical activity in the heart. Remember, epi is a pure sympathomimetic drug. Underlying, you know, we try to maybe reverse that metabolic and respiratory acid doses with some sodium bicarb. Now these are all prescribers choice. Perhaps giving some magnesium, hoping to correct underlying abnormalities, potassium, positively charged, you know, hydration all the while. Now prognosis for somebody in asystole is not good. Chances of survival are not that high. 
but this is what we do to try to make it successful. <laughs>